Alejandrina, Susanna, Campos, Joanne, Maria. Christy, Jimmy, Andrea, Leslie, Mia, Helene, Gilda, Alan. Elizabeth, yeah. Sandra, Donna, Janelle, Here. April, yeah. Janelle, Gibby, Kenneth, yeah. Casper, Jeffrey, yeah. Armin, Kim, Jason, uh -huh. Peter, Desmond, oh. Michelle,
Peter, Don, Taipia, Ricardo. Darlene, Cynthia, Andrea, Jeffrey. Work together. 
together, nothing really can be accomplished, especially in terms of public organizations, nonprofit organizations, and so forth and so on. All right. So what we did is uh, not last class, but the previous class, we talked about Orthodox public administration. But most of that was about putting together rules and regulations and policies to find the most efficient way of carrying out the tax. All right? But over time, people started to learn, managers started to learn that it was more than just putting people together in a specialized manner. You can actually increase productivity and effectiveness by getting people to dig deeper and to feel more a part of what it is that they're trying to accomplish. All right? So we'll go more into that. The photo right here, hands coming together in a circle, is something basic, but very difficult to do. Last week, we sat here, people did the homework, and then we came put together a couple of essays. All right? You see how difficult it is to work in a group. Put your minds together to accomplish something. Then to sit up, stand up, and articulate what it is that you did. But as you sit here today, a master's level public administration program, it's a management program. You say you want to be a leader. You put MPA on your resume, people are going to look up at you and say, oh, this person wants to be a leader. But what is leadership about? Leadership about you being a smart individual? Or is leadership about you sharing what you have, giving it to others so that they can accomplish something? That's what leadership is about. It's not easy. It's hard. But leaders who pay the big bucks. So not everyone rises up to that position. All right? I know it's difficult. That's why it's part of the curriculum and the assignments. Don't think you want to move into a leadership role. Everything is structured. There are rules and regulations, yes, binding your actions. Things come up on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't foretell. You don't know what's going to happen that morning. You need to be ready for it. You need to be willing, ready and willing to work with people who you may not be ready and willing to work with. If you can't do that, you're not going to be effective in this profession. Because nothing of significance is accomplished alone. Alright? The first, well not the first, but one of the things that we learned about one of the elements of orthodox administration is this concept of scientific management. All right? Now, scientific management, this concept is key. And the heart of this is that each element of work can be broken down to a science. And once you break down the elements of work down to a science, no matter what it is, whether it's flipping hamburgers, making houses, building cars, doing hair, making shoes, anything can be broken down to a science. But once you break down the elements of work, any work, you can train people, you can select and train people who will be the best at whatever it is that you're trying to do. Now the main thing here is that there is one best way to accomplish everything. Alright? One best way. Sometimes people part down on the line, they may see a way, save cost, or it's better for the employees. But the management, which is separated from the employees, it's 
not in their books, it's not in their studies. That new way may not filter to the top because management is separated from the labor.
all of us like it. You know, every day we had to do something different. It wasn't the same thing over and over. We had men working with us, so Mr. Heibarger and Mr. Chipman. Mostly Mr. Chipman, he was there with us all the time. He was nice. He was real nice. Hi, Mr. Chipman. Hi, Lord. Are you mad at the city old gang? I'm sure. Did you ever hear of the Hawthorne days? It probably isn't a textbook on human relations. It doesn't mention the Hawthorne studies. 1924 was the year it started. It all happened at this plant, the Hawthorne work. <laughs> Something 
very curious happened when new experimental lights were installed. Output went up among those employees being studied, and also among those whose lighting had not been changed. And most puzzling of all, it continued to go up even when lights were turned down. Having proved nothing, these studies were called off by the National Academy. It might all have ended there.
So, companies discover people and raised a question that persists. 50 years after the studies, has modern business yet struck the balance between the worker and his job? We can contribute something. I mean, we're not just machines and we're not just there turning out the paper, you know, and just watching the sheets fall out of the machine. We have ideas how to, to uh, better the shop. And um, I think they found out that uh, working as a group, um, our shop really contributed something. It seems to me that, uh, like I said, the new breed of supervisor likes participative management. And uh, we've been given that chance and it's worked out so far. We're facing the supervisor and it seems more or less like he's our equal. You know, he's on the same level as we are. I think the supervisor, he gets involved more. He gives us a chance to do things the way we want to do them, if, as long as we get the job done. Supervisory attitude is, is altogether different than it was in those days. You know, you can sit down and talk to the supervisor and tell him something about the job, he'll listen. Years ago, he was he knew everything. <laughs> in uh, in a lot of the uh, classes in the universities, the hard time studies often come up. But uh, how much stays with the uh, student when he gets to be a manager? I, I don't know. But uh, there's certainly a lot more there than we think there should. Some employees, and then when those two come on, 
you know, those two that were less days ago are now doing everything the way they're supposed to. And they don't necessarily have to interact, but it's just that presence of them being there. And that goes the same with the coordinators for, uh, for visitor services. When they're around, you know, you see us kind of engage more and do what we're supposed to do when they're around. And they don't, they don't have to actually be right beside us and see what we're doing or tell us, hey, why don't you engage with that person? It just happens when they're on. The mere fact that they're there, yeah. all right? Does anyone notice that about their jobs? When the oversight is there, when the boss comes around, things uh, get a little bit more uh, straight, rigid by the book.
Thus, your actions will be consumed with trying to obtain or meet these needs. The average individual. All right. Now, once you have these needs satisfied, for the most part, your mind or the average normal individual will start working on these needs. Security, the body, the employment, the resources, property, so forth and so on. All right? Then once an individual has these things, they move on to love and belonging, friendship, family, relationships, so forth and so on. And then it goes to self-esteem. At the very top, it's morality, creativity. Right. Now this is not an exact science right here, but it's a rough sketch. But what we want to take from this and see is that for the most part, employment is tied to safety. And that's kind of at the bottom of the pyramid. And what we can glean from this is that everyone wants to get a job and have that good job, the job that they want. But what happens is once people obtain that job, over time, it's not the number one thing or want that they have in life because they've obtained that. So they move on to something else. I'm not saying that they don't show up to work every day or do their job or meet the goals, but they've obtained that in life. So now human wants are insatiable. Alright? So once someone has money, they want to do good. Alright? That's why you see a lot of these millionaires, billionaires. What do they do? They start a nonprofit. Right? Some do. Because they want to seem good. Right? They want to seem like they're good people. They could be. Right? They don't profit from it, per se. Tax book. Tax book. Right up there. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But there's also some other type of benefit that they get from it. Right? Contributing, feeling good, and so forth and so on. Each and every one of you, you have jobs, you have positions, you want to move up, you want to do something, uh, you want to do something else that is more impactful, so forth and so on. And that feeling, that emotion, that thought is kind of what ties into this. Once you have one level, secure something, the way the mind works, the way the average individual works, is you want to move on to something else. You want to secure something else. All right? Be employment or be something else. Another concept of Douglas McGregor, what he tried to do, or what he did, take this concept of scientific management and human relations and said that for the most part leaders, managers will fall into either one camp either a theory X or a theory Y but each one of those theory X or theory Y is really predicated upon the uh, manager's perception of their employees or about employees in general. And it's not necessarily based upon the actions, but it's at a deeper level. It's about that manager's uh, that real theory about human nature. Theory X is based upon the principles of scientific management. So the concept will say, or manager will think, 
You got a good example in your head right now? <laughs> Manager assumes that employees are inherently lazy and will avoid work at all costs. All right. If they can avoid work, they will do it. All right. Workers need to be closely supervised. Because if not, they will avoid work. They will cheat the system. All right? So instead of having a, a wide span of control, what that means is for every one employee, you know, for every one manager, they supervise about five people. That's a small span of control. One to 15, if you're one manager, you have 15 people working for you. It's less uh, amount of time you have to oversee what everyone's doing. You have to have more trust, all right? So theory X, they don't have that much trust. Right? So it's more of a hierarchy. Now in this, the employee's sole purpose to come into work is money. Now for the most part, that's why you go to work is money, because it costs money to get to work. Right? Cost money to get to work. If something goes wrong, it's the employee's fault. Because, in the theory of scientific management, every process and procedure has been vetted. There's been studies, studies done, and it's worked. So if something goes wrong, it's not the system, it's the employee. Well, he doesn't fit into the system properly. Now, the flip side of this, you have your theory why. It says that individuals are self-motivated and can exercise self-control. So a person's not motivated by money. That's part of a little bit of it, but their main thing is they're motivated to come to work and do a good job. So if the manager provides the right conditions, the right conditions, most people will do not just the bare minimum, but they'll do well their job but well. Management theory creates an open shared environment.
But if you write the Watson, they say it doesn't turn out to be very right. Who can be self motivated and exercise and come to this book? So it's a balance, right? So you, you let them be self motivated, but you give them guidelines and deadlines. And however you get there, you get there, but when I come to mind, that's right. I mean, that's, 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 that's how it goes to my team. I don't care how you make it, what kind of train you roll, but when I ask for mine, that's what I, you need to have. So they can do it however they need to get it done. Here's a good example. The theory why every individual has a say in what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, how it needs to be done. All right? You have difficulty, first of all, getting agreement on what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and when it needs to be done. Now, on some level, theory why raises productivity. But without the parameters, guidelines, policies, and procedures, and so forth and so on, nothing can get done. Right. Mm -hmm. All right? You can see that working in a group. Right? In order to get something done, everyone in the group has to give up something. Some of your individuality some of your personality, for the betterment of the whole. But it doesn't always work that way. Not here, not in our society.
But in doing that, once they start tapping into that, then they have to accept you as an individual, a unique individual, a human being, a person. So the dynamics of the relationship tend to change. Not just to replace a part of the machine. You're an individual with a past, a future, family. Issues. Issues, right? Do they look like 
future plans. I've learned that things are not always as easy as they appear. Find out next on Undercover Boss. Headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, White Castle is America's oldest hamburger chain. Owned and operated for 88 years by one family. But now, a new generation is poised to take over the family business. My name is David Gray. I'm the oldest member of the fourth generation of the Ingram family, and I'm an owner of White Castle. We have grown from one restaurant in 1921 to 421 restaurants 88 years later. My great-grandfather, Bill Ingram, founded this company based on the belief that people are the most important asset that we have. We've taken something that was started 88 years ago and grown into this wonderful business and family. Dave is very proud to be part of the White Castle family. Some of our early dates were at White Castle. That's where he loved to be and that's where we went. What kind of roof do you think we're going to get? Whatever color you want. My wife, Lynn, she's my rock. She keeps me grounded, she keeps me going. My boys, I love them both to death. To make sure that this bracket's tightened up and that bracket's tightened up, okay? Being part of the family that owns White Castle has enabled me to have a pretty nice lifestyle. Um, I've got a lot of toys. But if I would not have changed some of the habits in my life, I probably wouldn't have been around very long. In the last two years, I've undergone this metamorphosis. At my heaviest, I was 271. I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I was a heart attack weight and a half. I just one day woke up and decided it's time to make a change, so we did. I've worked very hard in the last couple of years to go from that me to the me I am now. I think I've saved my own life. Push, 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 die! That's the cake. It took a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication to succeed at that. Now I want to take that same hard work and dedication and what I learned from that transformation to see what I can do to benefit this company and my family. My great-grandfather started this company with some core principles. Um, integrity, honesty, job security. I want to go out and recover to make sure that those core principles are still in place today. Because this isn't just a job to me, this is my life. This is my family's life. I would hope that my grandparents would say that they're proud of me of the man I've become, um, of the person I've become. I believe in my heart there's someone looking down at me telling me, thinking that I, I, I did it right. Right now, I'm about to go into a family meeting and address the other owners of White Castle on the adventure that I'm about to partake in. staying in 
in particular hotels. Hi there, I'm checking in. That are in line with somebody who's new to town and working in an entry level position. Yes. Yeah. 
scared. And I don't want to die. When I went into this, I was kind of approaching it from a procedural mindset. I really didn't expect to connect with some of his team members. If we found out Donna had a heart attack two months from now, I'd have a lot of guilt. If I wouldn't have made the changes I made a couple of years ago, I don't know if I'd be here right now. It's kind of a uh, very somber thought. Castle run 24 hours, including Dave's undercover mission. As night falls, he's on to his second shift in one day. This is the bakery. One of the things that my great grandfather believed was serving a quality product can do a better job when you control as many variables as possible. So we make our own buns.
see if it's being utilized to its fullest. Hi, I'm Dave. Hi, I'm Tina. Go oh, ahead and leave Dave before. If you want to just go to the restroom and change, and when you're done, I'll come back here and I'll show you around. I'll be right back. All right, Dave. Cheeseburgers plate. Anything to do with that? 
happy employees made for happy customers. Well, principle of that belief, happy employees should also be productive employees. How are you doing? I'm Dave. Nice to meet you. I'm here important for work. If this is your time card, you will clock in. You want to put a hair net on. Yes, ma'am. Your hair must be covered. You must wear an apron. You want to be here and you want to clock in five minutes before. Five minutes before we'll start the shift. Notice you were a little bit late. So if you can, please try to be on time. Yes, ma'am.
I'll help him not to get fired. He'll shock his co-workers and reveal his true identity. I'm Dave Wright. I'm on the owner's podcast. Thank you. 
perspective, what is the, the ideal supervisor like? A supervisor that's on the floor working and helping out, not someone who's going to stand at a desk or sit in the break room. I do help out a lot. Yeah. Once in a while, we might get a moment to just stand at the desk and rest for a little bit. And I want them to help out too. Not depend on the supervisor to do it all. And what I'm asking for is this you two are going to work together on your end to start building teamwork. The other part of this is making sure to listen to what Vicky's telling you, okay? I'm going to follow up here. I'm going to check in. I'm going to come back down and revisit you guys. You guys are going to work together, right? Yes, I will. I want that too. I will do that. I do feel better that they finally listened to our problems that they heard through home office. And I know me and Brenda, we can put in an effort to try to do it once. People like you are why we are so successful. You've epitomized what we want as part of our extended family. And what I would like to do is I want to create a program called Leaders for Tomorrow. And I would like to ask you to help us write the curriculum. I would also like for you to be part of the first class of that program. What do you think? Come on. I'm trying to get myself together. I can't believe this. I want to do it.
from our next episode. Walk around, walk his office, 
slam the door. He would always uh, tell everyone, oh, you're walking on thin ice. But he, at the end of the day, he got things done. He was very productive. The workers did not like him. But for some reason, he met his goals. Right? He was a clear theory man. But it's also his generation. Because a lot of uh, baby boomers in the uh, generations before that, whatever the manager said was right. If you don't like it, you can get another door, you can get another job, so forth and so on. Now our society has transitioned more. It's more of a human relations approach. Everybody has a say in what goes on. And part of that is the access to information that we have now. The internet only really started to become something that was widely available to each and every one of us in the late 90s. 1997, 1998, people started getting home computers. AOL was a big thing, right? These cell phones that we have, we have access to instant information, Communications makes you much more powerful. You have a lot more knowledge now. That leverages your ability to speak up on things, to have a say in what's going on, or at least to know what's going on. All right? That also plays into this uh, uh, management, having to be more, more open, public agencies, having to be more responsive to the needs of citizens because they have more access to information now. Right. For example, if at one time you want to know what was going on in the city, or what the budget was, you had to go to City Hall. You had to ask around. Most likely the person wasn't there. You had to go and you had to come back. It was a hassle. Now you just go online. A lot of you can right here, right now, type in your City Hall, Google, budget, whatever city you live in, it will pop up. But from this video, I want you to look at the traits of organizations, recognize what is scientific management, how does it apply to modern day organizations that are all around us. But I also want you to be able to start seeing what is the human element in all of this, and how does it impact or play into, or in some ways contradict scientific managerial theories. All right. Now, at the end of this movie, we have the people who were interviewed and participated. They were happy because they got something. All right. What about the other thousand stores? Are things going to change for the people that work in the other stores? Yes, they can because she's going to be able to do what they see as a trend. Well, we manage it. So they want to relate that to what they saw. What's going to change? Um, Productivity? Um, Productivity? No, the manager's remaining. Oh, but they, they're going to change the manual? But, and what do they revise the manual to? Recognition of the employee, right? Yeah. Change the incentive. Change the incentive. Add some incentives. Or add some incentives. Yeah. Make the employees feel like people. Make the employees feel like people. All right. Over a thousand stores, right? So you have to develop some type of system. You have to systematize how you're going to make people feel needed, wanted, a part of something that's greater than them as individuals, right? What I'm getting at is in one way or another, one, the scientific management and human relations approach, they can't really exist without the other in complex organizations. You have to be very familiar with both of these theories and concepts to see how they play out in the organization. 
and we go into a place and you can start recognizing this is mostly theory X location or theory Y. We walk around, do they have cameras? Are they welcoming? Do the people look happy? All right? What is the manager like? Are they sitting level and equal with the group? Are they up high? Do they even know the managers? All these things are important because once you step into a leadership role, you have to understand what is your own personal theory of leadership and how is it going to play out. Because in the end, a lot of these things, they conflict. At some point, they conflict. They're contradictory. Because you have policies and procedures. People need to be at work at certain times. They're not at work. They can't uh, fill the ship. But yet people have personal problems. Their kid is sick. All right? If you don't reprimand that person, how does that impact the other people in the organization? So everyone show up late. At some point, these ideas, these concepts contradict themselves. But you have to be familiar with them so you understand these fine lines. Okay? Now there's homework due next week. And in the syllabus, there's three questions. But I added, I went uh, and put a little bit more depth in here related to the video. If you answer these questions, you'll pretty much be answering the same questions. Okay. That's going to be on the angel. That's going to be on the angel, correct? Yes, it's on angel. Okay, okay. so Professor, just I'm glad you'll be answering that. This is the same as First thing is, what's the leadership philosophy of White Castle? It's a leadership philosophy. But it's not just enough to say what is a leadership philosophy. Tell me why. Explain your reasoning.